I hope you guys are well. Happy Halloween. I hope uh, uh, you all en- have enjoyed the holiday so far. Um, my wife and I uh, are currently living in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, in particular, I have a passion for uh, kind of speaking uh, words out loud in terms of stories. Um, Ed Allan posed the Raven as a personal favorite of mine. And yeah, uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, begin reading it. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the Mari, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping. And so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I was scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mane of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot but help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door was such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, (laughs) other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. 
but the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy upon fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned in my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet, violet lining with the lamplight gloated o'er, she shall press, ah, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, Perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by the angels he has sent thee. Respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me, truly I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign in parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of thy lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the semen of a demon's that is dreaming. The lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. And that is Edgar Allan's pose, The Raven. So, uh, fun fact uh, for, I guess, the two of you who are on right now, uh, glad to have you here, uh, is that the Baltimore Ravens football team is named after... Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven Poem, um, which I believe is the only professional sports team in the entire United States that is named after a poem. And that's pretty cool. Um, Edgar Allan Poe was uh, living at the time uh, when he wrote this, I believe, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, which is, um, again, I don't know uh, where the two of you may be calling from, but uh, Maryland is on the east coast of the United States. And... Um, Edgar Allan Poe is certainly one of the more uh, famous uh, folks uh, from Maryland during that time. I believe he wrote uh, The Raven in the 1840s. Uh, so this is a, a pretty old uh, poem. It's fun. There's a lot of uh, kind of uh, hidden meanings behind uh, the different parts of the poem. Um, and it's just kind of one of the spooky ones that I enjoy uh, reading over during this time of year. Okay, so I'm going to take a minute uh, and kind of refresh my vocal cords because the next one is a bit of a journey, but I'm really looking forward to this. So one of my favorite books of all time um, is uh, one that is written by the English author, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, and he wrote a book in the 1930s called The Hobbit. And The Hobbit, uh, for those of you who I'm sure you probably at least seen the movie, um, uh, but The Hobbit is star uh, basically features this character called Bilbo Baggins, and Bilbo Baggins is on an adventure. And when he goes on an adventure, um, he ends up uh, fleeing uh, this particular area uh, from goblins. Uh, and he is with this group uh, of a wizard, uh, consisting of a wizard, as well as um, 
I believe it's like 12 dwarves at the time. Uh, and they're on a quest for treasure to gain it back from a certain a Smaug the dragon. Uh, I'm not going to be reading about the chapter about Smaug the dragon, uh, though that chapter is really cool. Um, but I, I think you'll get the, the sense. Uh, right now, um, uh, to kind of give you a sense of where it is in the story, Bilbo has just found himself fleeing from the goblins and he's stuck in a cave. Uh, and then he meets this particular creature and this creature, uh, if you have seen The Hobbit or have seen Lord of the Rings, is probably going to find it very familiar. So I'm going to just take a minute or two. Uh, I'll play some music and then I will come back to you in one moment. And this is from The Village, uh, which was M. Night Shyamalan's movie in 2004. Varying opinions on how uh, people felt about the movie itself, but the score uh, was nominated for an Oscar uh, back that year. Um, and it's by James Newton Howard, uh, who I think is, I think he's American. I can't remember. Of course, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to ask in the YouTube chat too. Okay, guys. Continuing on. Yeah, a lot of people uh, didn't really like the village uh, because of the reveal. Um, interesting fact, though, about that is that apparently Shyamalan preferred just to write thrillers. Uh, but because of the sixth sense and the ending, um, I think a lot of people had expectations that he would write particular endings uh, like uh, the sixth sense, which obviously was either a hit, like in the sixth sense, or a bit of a miss, like the village. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it was also shot by Roger Deakins, which is kind of cool, uh, considering. Um, I think that's the only movie uh, by Shyamalan that Deakins ever filmed. So interesting fact, potentially. Okay, guys, so here we go. I'm going to be reading uh, from The Hobbit, uh, and this chapter is called Riddles in the Dark. <clears throat> now, Bilbo, certainly... Now, certainly Bilbo was in what is called a tight place, but you must remember it was not quite so tight for him as it would have been for me or for you. Hobbits are not quite like ordinary people. And after all, if their holes are nice cheery places and properly aired, quite different from the tunnels of the goblins, still they are more used to tunneling than we are. And they do not easily lose their sense of direction underground, not when their heads have recovered from being bumped. Also, they can move very quietly and hide easily and recover wonderfully, wonderfully from falls and bruises. And they have a fund of wisdom and wise sayings that men have mostly never heard of or forgotten long ago. I should not have liked to have been in Mr. Baggins's place all the same. The tunnel seemed to have no end. All he knew is that it was still going down pretty steadily and keeping in the same direction in spite of a twist and a turn or two. There were passages leading off to the side every now and then, and he knew by the glimmer of his sword or could feel with his hand on the wall. Of these, he took no notice, except the hurry past for fear of goblins or half-imagined dark things coming out of them. On and on he went, and down and down, and still he heard no, no sound of anything except the occasional whir of a bat by his ears, which startled him at first, till it became too frequent to bother about. I do not know how long he kept on like this, hating to go on, not daring to stop, on, on, until he was tireder than tired. It seemed like all the way to tomorrow and over to the days beyond. Suddenly, without warning, he trotted splash into water. Ugh! It was icy cold. That pulled him up sharp and short. He did not know where it was. He, he did not know whether it was just a pool in the path or the edge of an underground stream that crossed the passage or the brink of a deep, dark subterranean lake. The sword was hardly shining at all. He stopped, and he could hear, when he listened hard, drops, drip, 
drip, dripping from an unseen roof into the water below, but there seemed no other sort of sound. So it is a pool or lake, not an underground river, he thought. Still, he did not dare to wade out into the darkness. He could not swim, and he thought, too, of nasty, slimy things with big, bulging, blind eyes wriggling in the water. There are strange things living in the pools and lakes in the heart of the mountains. Fish, whose fathers swam in, goodness only knows how many years ago, and never swam out again, while their eyes grew bigger and bigger and bigger from trying to see into the blackness. Also, there are other things more slimy than fish. Even in the tunnels and caves the goblins have made for themselves, there are other things living unbeknown to them that have sneaked in from outside to lie up in the dark. Some of these caves, too, go back in their beginnings to ages before the goblins, only who widen them and join them with passages, and the original owners are still there in odd corners, slinking and nosing about. Deep down here by the dark lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat, and he rode about quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make. Not he. He was looking out of his pale lamplight eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat, too. Goblin, he thought good, when he could get it, but he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind if they ever came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunneling down long ago, and they found they could go no further. So there their road ended in that direction, and there was no reason to go in that way, unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither fish nor goblin came back. Actually, Goblin lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no Goblin at all. Goblin Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island, while Bilbo was sitting on the brink altogether flummoxed and at the very end of his way in wits. Suddenly, up came Gollum, whispered, and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast, at least a toasty morsel, that make us Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing sound in his throat. That is how he got his name, though he always called himself my precious. The hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who are you? He said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. What is who, my precious? Whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself, though through never having anyone else to speak to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious. Afterwards, he would have grabbed, otherwise he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. I am Bilbo Baggins. I have lost the dwarves, and I have lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know if only I can get away. What's he got on his hands? said Gollum, looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. A sword, a blade which came out of Gondolin, said Gollum, who became quite polite. Perhaps the sitzer and shots with a bit my precious. He likes riddles. Perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly, at any rate for the moment, until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone, really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. Asking them, and sometimes guessing them, had been the only game he had ever played with any other funny creatures sitting in their holes in a long, long ago, before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone and crept down down into the dark, under the mountains. Very well, said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree, until he found out more about the creature, 
whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblins. You ask first, he said, because he had not time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hissed. What has roots that nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up it grows, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bilbo. Mountain, I suppose. Does it guess easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious asks, and it doesn't answer, we eats it, my precious. If it asks us, and the wizard doesn't answer, then we does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes? All right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree, and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was a rather old one, too, and Gollum knew the answer as easy as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my precious, but we only have six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless, it cries. Wingless, flutters. Toothless, bites. Mouthless, mutters. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind, wind, of course, he said, and he was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. This'll puzzle the nasty little underground creature, he thought. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before, when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in the bank by a river. My precious, he said, sun on the dazzles of moons it does. But these ordinary above-ground, everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of the days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry, so this time he tried something a bit more difficult and a bit more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills, and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard this sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. Dark, he said, without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. A box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. He asked to gain time, until he could think of a really hard one. This, he thought, a dreadfully easy chestnut, though he had not asked it in the usual words. But it proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself. And still, he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some time, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it? He said. The answer's not a kettling, kettle boiling over, as you seem to think from the noise you are making. Give us a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. Well, said Bilbo, after giving him a long chance, what about your guess? And suddenly Gollum remembered, thieving from nests long ago, and sitting under the riverbank teaching his grandmother teaching his grandmother to suck. Eggs, he hissed. Eggs, it is. Then he asked, alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. He also, in his turn, thought this was a dreadfully easy one, because he had always, he was always thinking of the answer, but he could not remember anything better at the moment. He was so flustered by the egg question. All the same, it was a poser for poor Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and, and have not had the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo 
Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure himself. to himself. Is it nails, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? He began to peer at he began to peer at Bilbo out of the darkness. <sighs> Half a moment, said the hobbit, shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. But must make haste, haste, said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get at Bilbo. But when he put his long webby foot in the water, a fish jumped out in a fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. Ugh, he said, it is cold and clammy. And so he guessed, fish, fish, he cried, it is fish. Gollum was dreadfully disappointed, but, Go but Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as he ever could, so that Gollum had to get back into his boat and think. No legs lay on one leg. Two legs sat near on three legs. Four legs got some. It was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it if he had asked it at another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs was not so very difficult, and after the rest was easy. Fish on a little table, man at table sitting on a stool. The cat has the bones. That, of course, is the answer, and Gollum soon gave it. Then he had thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he said. This thing all things devours, birds, beasts, trees, and flowers, gnaws, iron, bites, steel, Grinds hard stones to kneel, slays kings, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Poor Bilbo sat in the dark thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard of in tales, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different, and that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, give me more time, give me more time. But all that came out with a sudden squeal was, time, time. Bilbo was saved by pure luck, for that, of course, was the answer. Gollum was disappointed once more, and now he was getting angry and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time he did not go back to the boat. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. That made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious lass. Lass, lass, just one more question to us. Lass, lass said Gollum. But Bilbo could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting next to him and pawing and poking him. He scratched himself. He pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us! Ask us! said Gollum. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with the other hand. There he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. What have I got in my pocket? he said aloud. He was talking to himself, but Gollum thought it was a riddle. He was frightfully upset. Not fair, not fair, he hissed. It isn't fair, my precious, it is, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pockets. Bilbo, seeing what had happened, and having nothing better to ask, stuck to his question. What have I got in my pocket? he said louder. <laughs> hissed Gollum. But it must give us three guesses, my precious, three guesses. Very well, guess away, said Bilbo. Hansels, said Gollum. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had just luckily taken his hands out again. Guess again, said Gollum, more upset than ever. He thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fish bones, golem's te er, goblin's teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, a sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on, and other nasty things. He tried to think of what other people kept in their pockets. Knife, they said at last. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had lost his time. 
who had lost him his some time ago. Last guest. Now, Gollum was in a much worse state than when Bilbo had asked him the egg question. He hissed and spluttered and rocked himself backwards and forwards and slapped his feet on the floor and wriggled and squirmed, but still he did not dare waste his last guess. Come on, said Bilbo. I'm waiting. He tried to sound bold and cheerful, but he did not feel at all sure how the game was going to end, whether Gollum guessed right or not. Time's up, he said. Mm, string or nothing, shrieked Gollum, which was not quite fair, working in two guesses at once. Both wrong cried Bilbo, very much relieved, and he jumped at once to his feet, put his back to the nearest wall, and held out his little sword. He knew, of course, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense antiquity, and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it. But he felt he could not trust the slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. Any excuse would do for him to slide out of it. And after all, that last question had not been a genuine riddle, according to the ancient laws. But at any rate, Gollum did not at once attack him, he could see the sword in Bilbo's hand. He sat still, shivering and whispering. At last, Bilbo could wait no longer. Well, he said, what about your promise? I want to go. You must show me the way. Hmm. It was so, so precious. Show the little nasty bagginses the way out. Thus, thus. But what has it got in its pockets is all? Not string, precious. But not nothing. Oh, no. Never you mind, said Bilbo. Promise is a promise. Crossitals and pleasant, precious, hissed Gollum. But it must welt, thus it must. We can't go up the tunnel so hastily. We must go and get some things first, thus, things to help us. Well, hurry up, said Bilbo, relieved to think of Gollum going away. He thought it was just making... An excuse, an excuse and did not mean to come back. What was Gollum talking about? What useful thing could he keep out in, in the Dark Lake when he was wrong? Gollum did not mean to come back. Gollum did mean to come back. He was angry now and hungry, and he was a miserable, wicked creature and already had a plan. Not far away was his island, of which Bilbo knew nothing, and there was in his hiding place he kept a few wretched oddments, and one very beautiful ring. Very beautiful, very wonderful. He had a ring, a golden ring, a precious ring. My birthday present, he whispered to himself, as he had often done in the endless dark days. That's what was once now, thus was once it. He wanted it because it was a ring of power. And if you slipped that ring on your finger, you were invisible. Only in the full sunlight could you be seen. And then only by your shadow. And that would be shaky and faint. My birthday present. The council me on my birthday, my precious. So he had always said to himself. But who knows how Gollum came by that present ages ago in the old days when such rings were still at large in the world. Perhaps even the master who ruled them could not have said. Gollum used to wear it at first, till it tired him. And then he kept it in a pouch next to his skin, till it galled him. And now usually he hid in a hole in the rock on his island, and was always going back to look at it. And sometimes he put it on, when he could not bear to be parted from it any longer, or when he was very, very hungry and tired of fish. Then he would creep along dark passages looking for stray goblins. He might even venture into places where the torches were lit and made his eyes blink and smart, where he would be safe. Oh yes, quite safe. No one would see him. No one would notice him till he had his fingers on their throat. Only a few hours ago, he had worn it and caught a small goblin imp. How it squeaked. He still had a bone or two left to gnaw, but he wanted something softer. Quite safe, thus, he whispered to himself. It won't see us, will it, my precious? No, it won't see us, and it's a nasty little sword. We'll be useless, quite thus. That was what, that what, that is what was in his wicked little mind as he slipped suddenly from Bilbo's side and flapped back to his boat and went off into the dark. Bilbo thought he had heard the last of him. 
Philip waited a while, for he had no idea how to find his way out alone. Suddenly, he heard a screech. It sent a shiver down his back. Gollum was cursing and wailing away in the gloom, not very far from the sound of it. He was on his island, scrabbling here and there, searching and seeking in vain. Where is it? Where is it? Bilba heard him crying. Lost it is, my precious lost! Lost! Curse us and crush us! My precious is lost! What's the matter? Bilbo called. What have you lost? It mustn't ask us, shrieked Gollum. Not its business, no, Gollum! It's lost, Gollum! Gollum! Well, so am I, cried Bilbo, and I want to get unlost. And I won the game, and you promised, so come along. Come and let me out, and then go on with your looking. Utterly miserable as Gollum sounded, Bilbo could not find much pity in his heart, and he had a feeling that anything Gollum wanted so much could hardly be something good. Come along, he shouted. No, it's not, my precious, Gollum answered. We must search for it. It's lost. But you never guessed my last question, and you promised. Never guessed, said Gollum, and suddenly out of the gloom came a sharp hiss. What has it got in its pockets? Tell us that. It must tell us first. As far as Bilbo knew, there wasn't there was no particular reason why he should not tell. Gollum's mind had jumped to a guess quicker than his, naturally, for Gollum had brooded for ages on this one thing, and he was always afraid of it being stolen. But Bilbo was annoyed at the delay. After all, he'd won the game, pretty fairly, at a horrible risk. Answers were to be guessed, not given, he said. But it wasn't a fair question, said Gollum. Not a, not a riddle, precious, no. Oh, well, if it's a matter of ordinary questions, Bilbo replied. Then I asked one first. What have you lost? Tell me that. What has it got in its pockets? The sound came hissing louder and sharper. And as he looked towards it, to his alarm, Bilbo now saw two small points of light peering at him. As suspicion grew in Gollum's mind, the light of his eyes burned with a pale flame. What have you lost? Bilbo persisted. But now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire and it was coming swiftly nearer. Gollum was in his boat again, paddling widely back to the dark shore, and such a rage of loss and suspicion was in his heart that no sword had any more terror for him. Bilbo could not guess what had maddened the wretched creature, but he saw that all was up, and that Gollum meant to murder him at any rate. Just in time, he turned and ran blindly back up the dark passage, which he had come, keeping close to the wall and feeling it with his left hand. What has it got on its pockets? He heard the hiss loud behind him, and the splash as Gollum leapt from his boat. What have I, I wonder, he said to himself, and he panted and stumbled along. He put his left hand in his pocket. The ring felt very cold as it slipped quietly onto his groping forefinger. The hiss was close behind him. He turned now and saw Gollum's eyes like small green lamps coming up the slope. Terrified, he tried to run faster, but suddenly he struck his toes on a snag in the floor and fell flat with his little sword under him. In a moment... Gollum was on him, but before Bilbo could do anything, recover his breath, pick himself up, or wave his sword, Gollum passed by, taking no notice of him, cursing and whispering as he ran. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark. Bilbo could see the lights of his eyes palely shining even from behind. Painfully, he got up and sheathed his sword, which was now glowing faintly again, Then, very cautiously he followed. There seemed nothing else to do. There was no good crawling back to Gollum's water, Perhaps if he followed him, Gollum might lead him to some way of escape without meaning to. Curse it! Curse it! Curse it! hissed Gollum. Curse the Bagginses! It's gone! What has it got in its pockets? Oh, we guessed it! We guess, my precious! He found it! Yes, he must have! My birthday present! Bilbo pricked his ears. He was at last beginning to guess himself. He hurried a little, getting as close as he dared behind Gollum, who was still going quickly, not looking back, but turning his head from side to side, as Bilbo could see from the faint glimmer on the walls. My birthday present! Curse it! How do we lose it, my precious? Yes, that's it! When we came this way last, when we twisted that nasty young squeaker, that's it! Curse it! It slipped from us after all those elders and elders! It's gone! Suddenly, Gollum sat down 
They began to weep. A whistling and gurgling sound horrible to listen to. Bilbo halted and flattened himself against the tunnel wall. After a while, Gollum stopped weeping and began to talk. He seemed to be having an argument with himself. It's no good going back to that to search, no! He doesn't remember all the places we've visited, and it's no use. The Bagginses has got it in its pockets. The nasty Nowser has found it, he says. With guesses, Precious, only guesses. We can't know till we find the nasty Herbert and squeezes it. But it doesn't know what the present can do, does it? It'll just keep it in its pockets. It doesn't know, and it can't go far. It's lost itself, the nasty Nowser thing. It doesn't know the way out. It said so. It said so, thus, but it's a trickster. It doesn't say what it means. It won't say what it's got in its pockets. It knows. It knows the way then. It must know a way out. Yes. It's off to the back door. To the back door. That's it. The goblins as will catch it. It can't get out of that well, process. <laughs> goblins says, yes. But if it's got the present, our precious present, then goblins says, we'll get it. They'll find it. They'll find out what it does. We'll sound it ever safe again. Never. One of the goblins says, we'll put it on. And then no one will see him. He'll be there, but not soon. Even our clever eyes will notice him. And he'll come creepsy and tricksy and again catch us. Gollum, Gollum. Then let's stop talking, precious, and make haste. If the Bagginses have got that will, we must go quick and see. Go, not far now. Make haste. <clears throat> With a spring, Gollum got up and started shambling off at a great pace. Bilbo hurried after him, still cautiously, though his chief fear now was of tripping on another snag and falling with a noise. His head was in a whirl of hope and wonder. It seemed that the ring he had was a magic ring. It made you invisible. He had heard of such things, of course, in old, old tales, but was hard to believe that he had really found one by accident. Still, there it was. Gollum, with his bright eyes, had passed by him, only a yard to one side. On they went. Gollum flip-flapping ahead, hissing and cursing, Bilbo behind, going as softly as a hobbit can. Soon they came to places, where as Bilbo had noticed on the way down, side passages opened this way and that. Gollum began at once to count them. One left, thus, one right, thus, two right, thus, us, two left, thus, us, and so on and on. As the count grew, he slowed down and began to get shaky and weepy, for he was leaving the water further and further behind. He was getting afraid. Gollum's might be about, and he'd lost his ring. At last, he stopped by a low opening on their left as they went up. Seven right thus. Six left thus, he whispered. This is it. This is the well of the back door. Here's the passage. He peered and shrank back. But we'll dance to go in, process, no, we'll dance Goblins is down there. Lots of goblins is. We'll smell them. What shall we do? Curse them and crest them. We must wait for a precious wait and see. So they came to a dead stop. Gollum had brought Bilbo to the way out after all, but Bilbo could not get in. There was Gollum sitting humped right in the opening, and his eyes gleamed cold in his head, and he swayed it from side to side between his knees. Bilbo crept away from the wall once more, quietly, than a mouse. But Gollum stiffened at once and sniffed, and his eyes went green. He sniffed softly. He hissed softly, but menacingly. He could not see the hobbit, but now he was on alert, and he had other senses that the darkness had sharpened. Hearing and smell. He seemed to be crouched right down with his flat hands splayed on the floor, and his head thrust out, Nose almost for the stone. Though he was only a black shadow in the gleam of his own eyes, Bilbo could see or feel that he was tense as a bowstring, ready for a spring. Bilbo almost stopped breathing, and he went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away out of this horrible darkness while he had any strength left. He must fight. He must stab the foul thing, put out his eyes, kill it. It meant to kill him. No, not a fair fight. He was invisible now. Gollum had no sword. Gollum had not actually threatened to kill him, or tried to yet. 
and he was miserable, alone, lost. A sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. A glimpse of endless, unmarked days without light or hope of betterment. Hard stone, cold fish, sneaking and whispering. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. He trembled. And then, quite suddenly, in another flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he leaped. No great leap for a man, but a leap in the dark. Straight over Gollum's head he jumped, seven feet forward and three in the air. Indeed, had he known it, he had only just missed cracking his skull on the low arch of the passage. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him, but too late. His hands snapped into the thin air, and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped down the new tunnel. He did not see what Gollum was doing. There was a hissing and cursing almost at his heels at first, then it stopped. All at once there came a blood-curdling shriek, filled with hatred and despair. Gollum was defeated. He dared go no further. He had lost. Lost his prey and lost too. The only thing he had ever cared for is precious. The cry brought Bilbo's heart to his mouth, but still he held on. Now faint as an echo, but menacing, a voice came behind. Thief! 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 Bagginses! Rehansit! Rehansit! Rehansit forever! And then there was a silence. But that too seemed menacing to Bilbo. If goblins are so near that he smelled it, he thought, then they'll have heard his shrieking and cursing. Careful now, or this way will lead you to worse things. The passage was low and roughly made. It was not too difficult for the hobbit, except when, in spite of all care, he stubbed his poor toes again, several times, on nasty, jagged stones on the floor. A bit low for goblins, at least for the big ones, thought Bilbo not knowing that even the big ones, the orcs of the mountains, go along at great speed, stooping low with their hands almost to the ground. Soon the passage that had been sloping down began to go up again, and after a while, it climbed steeply. That slowed Bilbo down. But at last the slope stopped, the passage turned a corner and dipped down again, and there at the bottom of a short incline he saw, flittering, filtering round another corner, a glimpse of light, not red light as a fire or lantern, but a pale out of doors sort of light. Then Bilbo began to run. Scuttling as fast as his legs would carry him, he turned the last corner and came suddenly right into an open space, where the light, after all that time in the dark, seemed dazzlingly bright. Really, it was only a leak of sunshine in through a doorway, where a great door, a stone door, was left standing open. Bilbo blinked, and then suddenly he saw the goblins, Goblins in full armor with drawn swords sitting just inside the door and watching it with wide eyes and watching the passage that led to it. They were aroused, alert, ready for anything. They saw him sooner than he saw them. Yes, they saw him, whether it was by accident or last trick of the ring before it took a new master. It was not on his finger. With yells of delight, the goblins rushed upon him. A pang of fear and loss, like an echo of goblins' misery, smote Bilbo, and forgiving and forgetting even to draw his sword, he struck his hands into his pockets. And there was the ring still in his left pocket, and it slipped on his finger. The goblins stopped short. They could not see a sign of him. He vanished. They yelled twice as loud as before, but not so delightedly. Where is it? They cried. Go back up the passage, some shouted. This way, some yelled. That way, others yelled. Look out for the door, bellowed the captain. Whistles blew, armors clashed, swords rattled, goblins cursed and swore and ran hither and thither, falling over one another and getting very angry. There was a terrible outcry to do and disturbance. Bilbo was dreadfully frightened, but he had the sense to understand what had happened and to sneak behind a big barrel which held drink for the goblin guards and so get out of the way and avoid being bumped into, trampled to death or caught by fuel. I must get to the door. I must get to the door, he kept on saying to himself. And it was a long time before he ventured to try. Then it was like a horrible game of blind man's bluff. The place was so full of goblins running about, and the poor little hobbit dodged this way and that, was knocked over by a goblin who could not make out what he had bumped into, scrambled away on all fours, slipped between the legs of the captain just in time, got up, ran for the door. 
It was still ajar, but a goblin had pushed it nearly too. Bilbo struggled, but he could not move it. He tried to squeeze through the crack. He squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and he stuck. It was awful. His buttons had gotten wedged on the edge of the door and the door post. He could see outside into the narrow opening, and there were a few steps running down into the narrow valley between tall mountains. The sun came out from behind a cloud and shone bright on the outside of the door, but he could not get through. Suddenly, one of the goblins inside shouted, There is a shadow by the door! Something is outside! Bilbo's heart jumped into his mouth. He gave a terrific squirm. Buttons burst off in all directions. He was through with a torn coat and waistcoat, leaping down the step like a goat, while bewildered goblins were still picking up his nice brass buttons on the doorstep. Of course, they soon came down after him, hooting and hallooing and hunting among the trees, but they don't like the sun. It makes their legs wobbly and their heads giddy. They could not find Bilbo with the ring on, slipping in and out of the shadow of the trees, running quick and quiet, and keeping out of the sun. So soon they went back, grumbling and cursing to guard the door. Bilbo had escaped. And that is the riddles in the dark chapter. And uh, so if you guys haven't read uh, Lord of the Rings uh, and or The Hobbit, The Hobbit was first written and then uh, Tolkien spent, I think, 12 years total uh, writing uh, Lord of the Rings. The, the one fact that I know in particular, at least about the writing of it, so far as I understand anyway, um, is that Tolkien participated in a kind of creative writing group uh, at the time when he was alive uh, as a professor for Oxford. And he would work with other people. And one of them was uh, C.S. Lewis who wrote the Narnia series. Um, there was a point apparently where Tolkien wanted to give up on the Lord of the Rings because again, it took 12 years to write, which is kind of crazy. And Lewis was very insistent upon, hey, this is this is good. What you have is really good. Uh, you should keep you should keep at it. So, I guess as a word of encouragement for anyone who is for those of you who may be watching and thinking about a story, something to write or something to to participate in, it's always good to have someone else uh, that has your back uh, to kind of uh, egg you on, uh, so to speak. So yeah, um, those are my readings for today. Thank you uh, for those who hung in there and listened. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to listen. I just was felt this would be fun uh, to do. Uh, if you have any particular questions, feel free to ask me. Um, you can, I guess, put it in the comment section either now or, or later on too. It works fine. Um, and then if you want to check out last night's stories, you can do that too. I read two stories by Ray Bradbury, which was The Foghorn and then A Sound of Thunder, which is less about, uh, less about ghouls and goblins and more like spooky monster stories, uh, which I particularly enjoy. So, um, Lastly, I'll say I don't have those two copies of The Raven and uh, The Hobbit specifically. I ended up, uh, I, it's, a, it's an app that I downloaded called Libby. Libby is a really helpful app if you have a library account uh, wherever you live. And you can attach your library account to that so that if the county library that you uh, have or the city library card that you have has a digital kind of ebook uh, uh, database, you can actually borrow books via that way. And it's a pretty good, uh, um, pretty intuitive uh, uh, app. So definitely recommend checking out Libby. So yeah, that's all I got, guys. I hope you are well. And thank you again for attending. And I'm going to spend a few minutes, let this wrap up. But again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And then I'm going to stop the uh, live stream. <laughs>